You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 360. And in this one, I got on Penny, who has kindly agreed to share her story with us. So in particular, we talk about her story, sexual orientation themed OCD, relationship themed OCD, figuring out it's OCD, getting married, exposure and response prevention therapy, working on issues in the relationship without OCD blowing them out of proportion, yoga, a reading of something she wrote and much more. Now, the sound quality is a little off in this one. We had some issues when when recording it. Uh, I've done my best in post to edit the sound quality, so bear with it, and it should be okay. Um, But really enjoyed hearing Penny's story. It was nice to meet her earlier on this year and and glad to finally get her on the show. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. And thank you to you guys, as always, for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here is Penny. Welcome to the show, Penny. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. And of course, we met, was it May? May in London? Yeah, it was, yeah I'd just come over from Australia to visit my family. And I saw that the OCD conference was on and I thought, wow, you know, thank, you know, I've come all this way to visit my family and how great that I can now come to the OCD conference. So I booked a ticket yeah. and made my way up to London and some had a fantastic day yeah, yeah. meeting so many interesting people. And for the first time in my life, meeting other people that had OCD that I could talk to openly about, mm. about you know, OCD. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's awesome. It was a long time coming. Yeah, and it was really nice to to meet you there. <laughs> and um, so, uh, yeah, you know, as you know, I like to hear people's OCD stories. So, if you could share that now, as little as much detail, be good. Okay. Well, I um, didn't know I had OCD probably till five years ago, okay. and I'm now sixty. So it's been a, quite a long journey. Mm. Um, I. Looking back, um, my mum tell, tells me um, that I was given pills at about five. I don't know what. I'd become quite anxious. Um, they'd moved house. My sister was born. I'd gone to school, and I got quite anxious. And, you know, in those days, I didn't talk about mental health a lot. You know, I was just nervous. Going, um, I don't remember ever being anxious mm-hmm. at that point. And when I asked her, she said, oh, I don't know, there was something with tablets. And then when you went to school, you seemed all right. And then everything was settled, you seemed fine. Mm. So looking back, there was a little pathway all along the way. Um, my mum got quite sick when I was about 12, and she spent a lot of time in hospital. And I think that's where my uncertainty started to develop, not knowing. And in those days as well, I say those days, you know, it wasn't that long ago, um, people didn't talk about things. They didn't speak to children and say, you know, this is what's happening. You know, your mother might be might be looking bad, but this is what's happening. So um, I, I think I must have internalised that a lot. I'm not blaming anybody along the way because that's just the way it was. But I think that's where my uncertainty just started to develop. Um, but it didn't take um, strength probably until I was about 21 and I was in a relationship I've been in a relationship from quite a long age and I decided to leave the relationship and that actually gave me a nervous breakdown Mm. I became I I was anxious continually I was having panic attacks daily I couldn't do my job um and, and I, and this is a trigger, I know, but I did finish the relationship. I walked away from the relationship. Now, I don't know if that was RACD at the time, as I was never diagnosed. Mm. Um, but it definitely triggered a lot of anxiety in me because I felt better when I walked away. So I actually thought to myself, every time I'm anxious, 
it means nothing's right. It means I have to walk away from that situation. I couldn't tell the difference between my gut. I couldn't tell the difference between anxiety. Mm. So I moved around a lot. I work in the theatre. So I make up artists in the theatre. So I went on tour with the theatre. I went travelling. But it's the old saying, and I can't remember who said it, but it's that saying of, you know, everywhere I go, there I am. You know, mm, yeah. I still had my head with me, you know. So, and then I went to Australia. I decided to go off, over to Australia. And I think the change, not having my family around, I, had, I developed full blown um, HSCD, which I think now you call sexual orientation HSCD. Mm. <coughs> And I just hadn't convinced that I was gay. I couldn't think of anything else. Um, it just used to go round and round and round constantly. I managed to work because I had to, because I obviously was on my own and had to earn a living. Mm. Um, but I, I never thought of it as OCD because OCD to me was someone washing their hands, contamination. I went to a psychiatrist about the anxiety and they said, I was just suffering from depression and anxiety. Um, and maybe I was gay. Mm. So at the time, I had a really good friend. And he said to me, oh, I'm going to take you to a gay club then. Let's just go to a gay club. Let's just mm. go and sit in a gay club and see if you fancy any of the women. Which now, obviously, was ERP, wasn't it? Mm. It was a great ERP exercise. I said, oh, my God, okay. So he took me to a gay bar and we sat there and he said, well, do you fancy any of the women here then? And I was like, in a complete state of anxiety. Yeah. Um, and after that, I actually probably got a bit worse because I told somebody. And he didn't know it was OCD. He just thought, well, you know, she's just in, in denial. Hmm. And about, anyway, about six months after that, I um, met my partner. Um, and it all went away for a while. Went away for probably about a year, and then I had my son, and then it came back in full force. I was diagnosed with um, postnatal depression, which it wasn't. I know it wasn't postnatal mm. depression, and they put me on a postnatal depression course um, for about six weeks, where I learned about depression. But I remember drawing this picture, and the lady said to me, "Draw how you're feeling," and I was sitting by a tree. I drew an outline of myself sitting by a tree and wanting to have this peace with just all this fuzz around my head. And that was my picture. Mm. Um, anyway, carried on. I went to a couple of psychiatrists again. He said, well, maybe... By this point, I've got full-on RACD, I should add. So they said, well, maybe it is a relationship. Maybe you should be leaving the relationship. Um, I didn't want to leave the relationship. Um, I, I had two children by this point. Um, I didn't want to leave, leave the relationship. Um, and then I started down sort of self-help of yoga and trying to help myself. But again, the constant doubt, if you know OCD is, the constant questioning, the constant being in your head, and also the constant shame of thinking, am I a weak person? Maybe I should leave the relationship because I could be really just a weak person, you know. Mm. Um, I, it, it, it enabled me to sort of um, just keep seeking. I just didn't, I just didn't know what it was, but I didn't, I didn't know. I knew that I had depression and anxiety, but I didn't think my life was right. There was something wrong with my life, and obviously it was just had to change. Mm. So I started <laughs> going down the yoga route and trying all of that. And I'd have periods where everything would be okay, and then it would come back again. Um, my relationship split up. Again, I'm sorry, guys. I might be a trigger. Uh, my relationship split up. And, you know, really looking back on it, um, I wasn't living in England. I didn't have any support from my family. Um, obviously, I never told him, and it was all in my head, but I would have been quite hard to live with at that point. Mm. Um, but when he left, obviously I had a patch where I actually felt relief because I didn't have this stuff going around in my head anymore. Um, and I was on my own for about two, two and a half years where it was a struggle and I was getting depressed from just, you know, trying to bring up two children on my own. But 
I didn't have this constant thing going on in my head. And then I started dating. And wow, <laughs> did it come back? Mm. I was like, I'm going on a date for one night. I've never seen this person before in my life. And I've got the same fear and the same level of anxiety as I probably would have had committing to marriage. Mm. How can this be? How can this all call me back? And um, so I stopped dating for a while. And then I met my partner, who's now my husband. And we got on really well. Um, and I had full fledged OCD, uh, OCD, sorry, with that right from the beginning. And then I heard your podcast on OCD stories. And I remember the day I was in the kitchen and I was cleaning and I had, had, um, I was always on the internet. I was always looking for answers. I was always scrolling. I was always reading books about relationships, uh, which we all know now is a compulsion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was listening to most of these stories and you started talking about RSVD and sexual interaction or RSVD. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's what I've had. That's what I had. Um, it was like a light bulb. The light bulb just went on. And I thought, I've got to find out about this more and I've got to, I've got to, you know, move forward with this. And I did. And it took a while. It took a while because I couldn't find a therapist in Australia that dealt with my type of OCD. Um, and I had mind sessions and I had all different types of um, uh, talk, talking sessions. But I knew that I needed to find someone that did the um, ERP. And so um, about two years ago, a year and a half ago, NOCD came to Australia, mm-hmm. so I was able to go through the NOCD program. Yeah. And February last year, I married David. Nice. So, and I married him, and I, I'll say it now: I married him with um, OCD walking down beside me. Mm. It wasn't. Uh, it was at the wedding, and I had the doubts in a few years before, but it's something I wanted to do. So I lived by my values. And uh, yeah, I walked in and I got married, and uh, it's been it's been a journey which has been hard, um, but I have learned so much in the process. Um, and it's a it's a painful journey, and it's a very lonely journey. Um, but in that journey, I have learned a lot of. Um, um, gifts in life as in knowing myself and knowing how to deal with it mm. and knowing a kid and knowing what a compulsion is. And um, I just want to say out there to everybody that we are so much stronger than we have ever been. Mm. You know, because it is a bully sitting on your shoulder. And um, there's so much out there now for help. And, uh, yeah, so now I see my OCD as an actor um, who's an understudy. And this understudy is standing at the side of the stage thinking, I might get on one day. Let's just let that actor fail and I'm going to walk in and I'm going to take over the lines and eventually Mm. I'm going to be the one that stands up and takes on the act. Um, But it's just not letting it, just not letting it get that foot onto the stage. Mm. And it yeah. does sometimes, and um, it, you you know you just have to take another step forward and start a new day. Mm. So that's that's what I wanted to say to everyone. Is, yeah, um, always keep moving forward. Yeah, uh, and always always know that it it's not you. You're stronger than you think. Yeah, so that's that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Obviously, a lot more in in yeah. depth, but you know, in a nutshell. Thank you so much for obviously you know sharing your story and congratulations on getting married. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and what what was it like working with No CD? Um, really good, really good. I mean, they were very. Um, it was a different type of therapy because they don't give you any reassurance, you know, and, and 
I've, I had so many compulsions and so many bad habits over 35 years, which I didn't even know were compulsions. Mm. So, for instance, one of my compulsions was um, to count friends. And I started that very young in life, just after I think my mum got sick. And that was a sort of a reassurance to me that there was always people in my life if someone disappeared. Um, and so I found that very difficult. You know, we started on the ladder, right down the bottom of the ladder, um, about what I should be doing and how I should be. So we started right from one all the way up to 10, and 10 was obviously going to be married. Mm-hmm. Um, and things like, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I have this uh, obsession about David's tummy, okay? So sometimes, well, it, it, it's not flat, a flat tummy, okay? So um, they told me that I wasn't allowed to mention his tummy to him at all. Um, so I went out one night. When I came home, David was lying on the sofa, and he, he had a pizza, some chocolate, and was drinking a beer. And I was like, yeah. oh, my God, that's going to make his tummy huge. I thought, I can't mention his tummy. Anyway, I came out. I, I went and sat down and, and started sort of doing my breathing, the first, you know, trying to live with the uncertainty of it. Came out and I talked all the way around what could happen. I said to him about how did he know the contents of the calories of a pizza. And I just did this. And he looked at me and he said, You could have just said my tummy was getting big. So he knew about it. And it was the way I thought, wow, that's the way OCD is saying, you know, yeah. don't say it directly, but hey, let's say it indirectly. Mm. Let's go around this massive circle. And he knew exactly what I was doing. So um, we laugh now. And if I, if I do, he goes find me looking at it and starting to obsess, he'll say, well, yeah, it's getting massive, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. going to be huge. Mm-hmm. You wait till next, this time next year, you know, yeah. um, things like that. So, yeah. Um, and then learning how it jumps. You know, I got a bit of health OCD where I was right about health and different things. And um, yeah, and a bit of perfectionist OCD. So it did jump a little bit through the therapy. Um, but yeah, it was, and, and also the fact that they are sexy, um, that they're always there. And they've got peer support, which again is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, someone. Peer support um, worker as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So they were great. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing. Um, and you mentioned to me off air, which I thought was a really good point about now now figuring out what's OCD and what's maybe something that needs work on or attention on in the relationship. Um, and mm-hmm. obviously try not to let OCD get involved there. Um, yeah. So you just wanted to kind of expand on that if you're okay to do so. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I'm quite um, argument averse. So to me, part one of my triggers was if we have an argument that equals the relationship's not right, which equals I need to leave the relationship. Hmm. Um, so if I don't think something is, like, okay, driving, you know, especially traveling um, around, if I've told you off air, I was traveling with David six months and we were with each other more or less 24 mm. 7 so we're in the car and we're traveling around and um he's quite a nervous driver so he's nervous with me driving and um we might have disagreements on the road as partners do when mm-hmm. there's cars involved and um i hate that because as soon as we're arguing like that as i say it's like it's, you know um this isn't going to work so I had to learn that actually most people have arguments and have disagreements in their relationship. Yeah. Most people have doubts. And most people sometimes wake up and think, is he chewing that movie any louder? You know, mm. I could kill him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't stick. Mm. It goes through and they think, yeah. all right, look, I've got with him chewing like that, but it doesn't stick. And that was a real revelation to me. Because um, I didn't think that was true. I thought everything had to be perfect. Yeah. Had to be on this honeymoon 24 7. So now I'm thinking with a lot of conversation, a lot of open conversation, mm. 
And he has been, David has been fantastic um, because he will say to me, no, I think that could be, I think you're right there. I think that could be something that we could mm. work on. Or, okay. um, yeah. Yeah. Nice. But it is difficult. It is difficult because it can very easily send you back into your ICD circle. Mm. So, you yeah. know, it's like I said before, the, um, the, the understudy, you've got to start thinking, no, I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to yeah. let it. And last night, actually, I went with my sister to see a film. It was a romantic film. And there was one, someone, what did you say? Someone said something in the film which triggered me. And it went round and round in my head. And when I came out, I said to my sister, and I said, that thing they said about the I didn't even, what did they say? I didn't even know it. What, what, what did they say? And I just clicked onto it like that. And I thought, I'm not discussing it anymore. Mm. I'm not going to talk about it. It's there. I've seen it. I've acknowledged it. Now I'll move on. And I, mm. I didn't think about it again. Yeah. And I thought, Isn't that, that's another reminder that, to her, it just went straight over her head. You need to think about it. But to me, that one sentence mm-hmm. in that film went round and round. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, look, thank you, thank you for uh, for sharing that because I think it's important, as you said, a, a lot of people with relationship themed OCD that their mind will will go to like the end of the world, so to speak. It has to be perfect. Yeah. If it's not, then it's the end of the world. Well, when reality, as you say, all, all relationships have their issues from time to time. You know, two humans living together need that takes patience and practice. And um and yeah, where your brain might well, with someone's might get annoyed about the muesli, but then someone's with OCD, they're getting annoyed, but then it triggers that fight or flight. Ah, oh, this must mean it's not the right relationship if I'm getting yeah. angry about them chewing, you know? And in re- reality, it's just annoying to you, right? So that's it. That's the end of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, or, or if they don't agree with something that, that you hmm. agree with. You know, yeah. it's not the end of the world. It's just that they're, they're a different human being, you know? And I yeah. think. With um, ROCD, we think very much that they that they are part of us almost. Mm. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like they have to yeah. they have to have our same feelings, they have to have our same thoughts, they have to have mm. everything that is part of us. And um, they don't. They're, they're individuals that are living have chosen to live alongside us. Yeah, that's you a know? really good point. Yeah, and it's it's dealing with that um, that feeling that comes up. And also, it's dealing with the fact that, and I think this is, encompasses all of life, is you don't have to be happy. You know what I mean? You don't, you know, sometimes all the you're time. happy, sometimes yeah. you're sad. Yeah, mm-hmm. sometimes you're angry. Yeah. Um, and that's normal as well. Mm. But I think cause this, this you know, OCD in general makes you, makes you look at your feelings in such depth that you don't, you don't want any of the feelings. And that's where sitting with the uncertainty of a feeling comes up. And yeah. that's where yoga and yoga um, has really helped me, really helped me in yeah. sitting with those, those feelings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really, really, really good. With, I'm going to ask you about yoga in a minute. With, um, yeah. With uh, sexual orientation, OCD, uh, was that still present for you when you started working with your therapist, OCD therapist? No. Okay, so that had stopped. No, that wasn't. I have had um, feelings about it, um, but it was when I knew that I had OCD that I could actually say, right, well, that's part of it. Mm-hmm. So if I do maybe, you know, think, oh, that girl's attractive or whatever, mm-hmm. I will think that's just a normal feeling because you can find another woman attractive as mm-hmm. in, you know, yeah. nice looking or whatever. Yeah. Um, and if it does start, um, then I. I know what to do. So yeah, it was more the relationship I used to do. I had the therapy with, but then I use all of those things I've learned. If anything else comes up, mm. like with the, when I started getting the health OCD and I started um, looking up things on the net about, um, you know, health, and I'd had something wrong with my what it wasn't. I, I started getting some tests done for my heart, mm. and then I started just obsessively looking up what it could be or what it couldn't be, and then I recognised that. And thought, mm. oh, hold on, you know, put down the phone, put down mm. Google, <laughs> um, you know, don't do it. Mm. Yeah, 
Yeah. So um, I think I think yeah, you have to be. I think you do have to be aware that it can cross over, and you can get a, you can get obsessive thinking about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's just as I say, it's it, it's it's using your breath and it's it's saying right, I recognise it. I'm not going to take that next step. And sometimes, as I said, you, you, you can't help taking that next step. But as soon as you recognize it, then no one else can do it for you. Yeah. That's one thing I have learned. One, you have to, you, no one else can do it. People can help you, but no one else essentially can do it for you in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. So, uh, how has yoga helped, do you think? Um, well, at first, when I actually spoke to my NOC therapist, I'd done a year's training as a yoga teacher. Mm. And it was actually one of my compulsions, would mm. you believe? I actually did a year's training in yoga to start, so that I could have the answers to everything. If I did this year of per, you know, breathing every day and doing yoga, I would know everything. Everything, everything would be right. Mm-hmm. So that came with an innovation. That came with a bit of a wall. That's true, actually. Um, so I, um, but what I've learned through yoga, especially yin, yin yoga works very much with your automatic um, nervous system, mm-hmm. your flight and fright. And yin yoga means you get into a pose and you sit in that pose and you use your breathing with whatever comes up. So I found that really um, good to actually tune up my um, nervous system, mm. my vagus nerve. Um, because when we're in a state of fright or flight, a lot of the time, which we are when we're very anxious, our vagus nerve gets um, untoned like the rest of our body. And it just can ping into flight or fright um, very, very easily. So with yoga, you're learning to actually um, start to tune up that vagus nerve and tune up your flight or flight so it doesn't always go straight to um, that response it mm. goes to your parasympathetic ner- nervous system if this makes sense which is your rest and digest mm. so your body gets much uh, it, it learns to start to relax a lot easier yeah. and I found that when I was doing uncertainty and with, and with a trigger um, a lot of the time you have to do something. I'm not very good at just sitting and, and allowing that to come up. I want to be doing something. I want to move that energy through my body. Mm-hmm. So um, doing yoga, um, yin or yang yoga, whichever you choose, helps that energy. It's another tool. It helps that energy to move from your head, getting stuck in your head, down to your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and learning about the breath, um, how the breath helps to actually um, get you in rest and digest as well um, has been very helpful. And just little things like um, we breathe when we're very anxious from the top of our chest mm. and we need to breathe from the belly. Yeah. So just I'll put my hand up here. So just um, a little thing like if we breathe normally, we're usually breathing from our chest because that's how we've learned to breathe. But if we put our finger on our palm and then put our palm our fingers over our thumb, sorry. So we've got your thumb on mm-hmm. the, in our palm and we put our fingers over. We actually belly breathe. Our breath goes to our belly. Mm. So in times um, when I'm feeling very anxious, I'll do that and I'll naturally go to belly breath. And because I've done quite a bit of it, my body has learned to go back into digest, rest and digest. Mm. Um, so one of my things I would like to do is design yoga programs for people with OCD because I don't think a whole hour class um, in a studio is necessarily great because um, you know you could be thinking about have I got this pose right am I doing this right am I doing that right but really you only need 15 minutes Mm. really Um, and if you can do that when you have a trigger um it's called somatic exercise, you know, moving your eyes a certain way. Yeah. Um, all of all of those things just help rather than just trying to sit and think, right, well, I'm in a trigger now. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got to sit with it. I've got to sit with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also yeah. learning that, sorry, 
Okay, right. Learning it's a practice. It's a practice. Yeah. So you're not going to get this. You know, you get results in the practice, but it's called a practice because it is a practice. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's moving through with that practice and learning more, and um, and teaching your body, teaching your body again how to react, mm. rather than it just going into that um, flight flight mode. It's helped me amazingly with um, trauma after having OCD because I just wanted to mention a little bit about that because yeah. there's a lot that's said about that. And, um, you know, when you've had it for a long time and you've had this person talking to you, or my actors, I call it, and then you have periods of quiet, you don't really know what to do with that quiet. Mm. And then, of course, memories come back and, um, you know, it can be quite traumatic for family members. You know, um, the stick up of my marriage with my first husband, or well, my marriage, my partner, my first husband, first partner. Um, yeah, and there's all sorts of things um, that come back. And I think you've got to recognize that as well, but also doing a good practice every day helps you to maintain that mm-hmm. and keep you know, your nervous system stronger. So you've got your ERP, but also um, all the other things that you might put into your day. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really good points. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, obviously, at the start off air, you mentioned about wanting to read something. So, if you if you wanted to do that now, that'd be great. Okay. Um, the recovery journey is hard, and as anyone tells you when working on OCD, it is not curable to necessarily go away. The noise lessens. You are able to tolerate uncertainty better, recognize spikes, and think sometimes it is completely gone. But, and this isn't being negative, it is there waiting in the wings like an understudy, waiting to take a part. Like an actor, it can play many roles, ducking, diving, weaving its way in when circumstances might change or you don't recognise that it is actually the actor. Delivering well-rehearsed lines, trying to take on the lead role. Trying to convince an audience. Only OCD can convince us, make us doubt, look back, then project forward. Often this happens when you're feeling content, happy, even, dare I say, joyful. But it is just the understudy. It is just waiting in the wind. You are the driving force. You are the actor. Mm. Nice. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, very, very powerful. Good way to look at it. Yeah, you're, you're the actor. You're the lead role. You're the lead role. Yeah, yeah. just don't let the understudy come in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and you know, as I say, there are there are most people that um I've listened to on the radio and with OCD and I've spoken to um are very sensitive people mm. and you know, a, a, a kind people. And I think um sometimes that that's another thing that can that you can convince yourself that you're not or you're weak or but usually it's sensitive people. It's because you think deeply, it's mm. because you care. Yeah. And that's the positive side of it, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, mm. those are great values and traits. Um, so w- would you say there was, uh, we've talked about it a bit, but like like epiphany moments, light bulb moments where things just clicked for you and made, made sense, either from an OCD lens or like from a treatment point of view? Um. An OCD then. Yeah, let me, let me think about that one. Uh, well, I've had quite a few. I've had moments where um, I've had clarity, where I've, you know, um, moments where I've known that I've had OCD because I've had, a, I've had a moment of clarity where I thought, I remember the first time I thought, wow, what a beautiful day. Mm. I hadn't had a lot of joy up to then. I'd missed joy. Mm. And I thought i feel joyful that was a moment where i thought this is how i'm meant to feel mm-hmm. um or feeling a bit of gratitude for something because we're almost also much in our heads that we don't you know um gratitude and thankfulness and those sort of things that we miss when we're with ocd so those things to me became even if even if it's small even if you know i'm going for a walk and i suddenly think that's a beautiful flower to me, that's a reinforcement because 
I would never used to think like that. I always used to think, well, I always had things going around in my head. So um, that more or less that happened, and I remember that day where I just felt joy, which I hadn't mm. felt for so long. Yeah. Um, what else? Just recognizing it generally. Um, and I would say as well, when I came to the conference as well, because um, being that you, you've always got that what if, what if, what if, you know, always, but sometimes you might think, mm-hmm. mm, you know, did they get the diagnosis right? Which is, you know, the little actor coming in, the little stand in. Um, but coming to the conference and and talking to people there, and also missing, um, meeting Christy Hodges, mm. who talked about trauma as well. Yeah. Um, and and thinking there are people, there are you know people like me. You know, I am, mm. I am, um, I, an OCD. I have OCD, and I, and I think that is going to be a really big thing for me because I'm starting to tell people. I hadn't told people. I told two friends last week, because I'm in London now. Um, I've been here for six months. I've been meeting up with a lot of my friends. And I told two friends who knew me when I had my nervous breakdown back in London. I was working for our Shakespeare Company, and that's when I had my first breakdown. And I told them. And I thought they were all going to go, you know. Mm. And they said, well, we never knew. We never knew. But, you know. Good on you for telling us, and that's that's um, a great moment, I think. Mm. And you think someone accepts me for who I am when OCD tells you um, that you're not acceptable when you're in the middle of an OCD. You, you feel shame. You feel mm. um, worn out with it. Um, you're trying to hide it. You don't think people are going to like who you are. Um, so I've, I've, I'm an outgoing person anyway, but I've never really told many people what was going on inside. And that's the sadness of OCD because someone can look like they're 100% okay, mm. but you never know what's going on in someone's mind, do you? No, that's true. Yeah. And, you know, now it's given me um, a lot of empathy for people because I think you know, someone might be rude to you in a queue or whatever, but you don't know what's happening in their day-to-day life and what's going on in their mind. Mm. Um, so that, yeah. those are the realisations that, that I'm, I'm starting to have more since I've been in recovery. Yeah. Yeah, really, mm. really, really good point. Uh, so, you know, words of hope for anyone listening. What would you tell them? I would say keep speaking. Mm. Always be speaking. because. It is a journey, and I know that word is a bit, you know, modern, isn't it? Mm. Um, but you will come through it. You will come through it and take that first step. And if the first step isn't the right step, take another step and another mm. step. And eventually those steps will lead you to where you go. It took me 35 years, <laughs> but... Um, I didn't. I was always seeking, and you could say that was part of the OCD because I kept looking, kept looking, kept looking. I didn't mm. give up on it. I always knew there was something there that I needed to get on top of. But yeah, just I'd never give up, and you're stronger than you think. Yeah, you're always stronger than you think. Yeah, mm. really, really good points. Um, so uh, you could pick up the phone and call the twenty-year-old Penny. What do you tell her? Oh, what do I tell her? Yeah, what do you tell well, her? Well, just what I said then. I'd say, um, you know, there'll be times which will be very hard, but mm. you are you're, you're you're stronger than you think. You're, I would say, you know, always remember um, that there's a place inside you that is you. That is mm-hmm. essentially you, and it's stronger than you think. Yeah. And um, I would say to her, whatever happens, um, and I would say again, I would say whatever happens, always take one 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 step forward. And if, as I said to you before, if that doesn't work, another step. Keep seeking. Mm-hmm. But the strength you have, the strength inside you. Yeah, keep going. I would have Keep going. Yeah, 
nice because you never know what you're going to find apart from no. anything else do you? exactly you know? yeah you never know and you never know who you're going to meet and who you're going to help by your search mm. and i think every single one of us who's had this and has you know had a hard time with it um can help somebody else who's at the beginning of their journey yeah who hasn't taken that first step yet yeah yeah, really so good that, point. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and then lastly, you got a billboard. Let's say it's in Australia. What what do you want written mm. on that billboard? Keep speaking. Hmm. Keep speaking. Yeah. In life generally, I think. Hmm. Um, no, that's I, I would just have just keep speaking with a smiley face. <laughs> nice smiley face. So the smile always helps, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Um, so lastly, is there anything else you wish you yeah. could have said or shared today? Not really, no. I, I thank you for allowing me to share it, Stuart. And um I hope that um I uh, yeah, and I, I hope that someone it helps someone mm. um going down that road. And uh yeah, not really. And hopefully I'll um get my little yoga program together yeah. and uh, put it online for anyone who wants to see it. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. That's something, that's, something I'm, that's something I'm working on at the moment, a couple of things, but that's one of the things I think would be very hope, helpful for people. Yeah, mm. yeah, I think so. Um, well, look, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story. It was great to hear it. And, and yeah, I know it will help many. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.